history is is long, so I don't probably don't have time to tell the whole thing. But um, basically, the same story that most doctors who end up doing direct care uh, will tell is that at some point we were working for a hospital system and we experienced burnout. And um, I that I hit that peak, I guess, in about 2014. So that's when I reached out to Dr. Josh Umber, and he helped me start my practice. Um, it's actually located in Crestwood, Kentucky. I live in LaGrange. Um, it's near Louisville, Kentucky. Um, so I am uh, certified in family medicine and addiction medicine. Um, I'm, I'm starting to drop some of the more traditional certifications and going with NBPAS for, for numerous, numerous reasons. Um, and then the last point, I'd be nothing without Jesus, is very important to me. So it's the National Day of Prayer. So I just wanted, to, I just want everyone to know I'm praying for our country and for our world, and that you actually learned something from this. <laughs> um, so why, why direct care? Um, really, it's it's about ethics, in my opinion. Um, and I've heard other doctors say this. Um, I just didn't feel like I was providing ethical care for my patients. I didn't feel like I was providing high quality care for my patients. And then I also didn't feel like I had autonomy. I didn't feel like my patients had autonomy. So that's, that's the theme of this conference is patient autonomy. And that's very important to me as a patient and as a doctor. Um, so uh, this, this, You've probably seen this chart. This just shows kind of what, what has happened to medicine and healthcare over the years. We've seen a, an increase in the number of administrators um, and a decrease in the number or about, you know, a steady growth of physicians. But um, for the most part, we have more third parties involved in providing care. And that has, that has led to it being more expensive as well and less personal. Um, and now is definitely the time, I think, this is perfect timing for people and students who want to pursue this model. Um, one of the silver linings of the pandemic was um, it really decreased the trust uh, among patients and among people, um, the trust of our healthcare system. Unfortunately, that came along with some distrust of doctors and that's something that we're gonna have to earn back. And I think that this model is the way to do that. Um, so what is direct primary care? There, it is, there is a standard definition and the way that that helps us as doctors practicing direct primary care is with legislation in states that protect us from being overregulated. So in, in Kentucky, we have one there's, there's a website, dpcfrontier.com, which was developed by uh, Dr. Phil Eskew, which has a mapper showing where direct primary care doctors are located. And also it tells which laws in, in which states are an ideal place to practice in this way. Um, so we don't really bill any third parties except for the doctors that you've you've learned about who do, I guess they do bill employers. And that's fine, that's completely fine. I think that's appropriate. I have not, I have a few small businesses that I work with, but for the most part, my practice grew by word of mouth. And so I treat mostly individuals and families. And then also having been an addiction specialist, um, I was working part-time at an addiction clinic while I built my practice, which helped me to maintain my income. So. I think I owe credit to this meme to Dr. Vance Lassie. All right. So I'm not going to bore you with the law and, um, you know, all of that, all, all of the uh, logistics with primary care, but we were able to get a law passed in 2017. It's a great law. It keeps us from being overregulated. We are able to dispense generic medicines in Kentucky. There are some states where you can't do that. Texas is one of the states where physicians are not permitted to dispense. Um, this was really great during the pandemic because I was able to um, dispense hydroxychloroquine for COVID for, for many patients. I took it myself. Um, and I didn't have to worry about being harassed by the medical board. Um, I don't know, what your, whatever your thoughts are on those medicines, they're not dangerous. So it was just kind of ridiculous what happened during the pandemic with those medications. Um, we've been prescribing those medicines for decades. 
And then I contract with LabCorp. We have an, we have an arrangement called Client Bill. And so we're, we're able to pass that savings on labs onto the patients. Um, instead of the patient, for example, leaving the office, going to the hospital, and using their insurance for their labs, they get them at the office with me, and then uh, LabCorp bills me, I bill the patient. Um, it works out great. Those are some, some uh, sample costs to me and then also to the patient. I don't mark up the, the labs. I do charge a $5 phlebotomy fee. Um, but other than that, I mean, it's, it's extremely inexpensive. And people are blown away because they know, they've seen their EOBs. They know that they got the same labs prior to coming to see me. They, they know that, that their insurance was billed, you know, hundreds of dollars for the same labs that I can get for less than $30. And so they appreciate that. I also do direct addiction care. And um, I set that up as a, a monthly fee because I, more like a membership, but a higher cost, because I wanted to be available for people who were struggling with addiction. I wanted to be avail available for them after hours, especially if they were having triggers where they were thinking about relapsing. I wanted to, to add that in. And then um, I just use the cups, the urine drug screen cups. Um, for the longest time I had a urine drug screen company in my office and they lied. I'm sure you've heard these lies from other um, companies that come in and say, oh, we're going to do these labs, but we're, and they're going to get a bill, but they don't have, they don't have to pay it. And so <laughs> my patients were getting these pills for over a thousand dollars for urine drug screens. And I finally, I just did it. I just thought about it. And I thought, you know, this does not really give me that much information because I have a relationship with my patient. So my patients are going to tell me if they relapsed, you know, they're going to tell me the truth. So, um, and if they don't, they know that we're going to figure it out. <laughs> They've learned that. So there are specialties that can do direct care. Um, you've met some of them. And uh, the, there's benefits to both the doctor and the patient. Um, Pandemic tested, patient approved. We stayed open. We never closed. Um, I think at the very beginning of the pandemic, we did telemedicine for maybe the first two weeks. I sat down my my employees and I said, we're going to get this virus. So if you have a problem with that, you probably need to find another job. So um, we stayed open the whole time. We eventually got COVID in November of 2020. And then the other advantage, you know, also ended up being like, I did not have to um, worry about being told that I had to, you know, I was not mandated to get any kind of vaccines. I was able to offer vaccine exemptions, mask exemptions for patients. I'm just under the radar. <laughs> so it's, it's very nice. Um, and um, I do have hospital privileges. I, they threatened them during, when I, when I said I was not going to get the vaccine, but they never did. They never did, you know, dismiss me or whatever they said they were going to do. Um, our daily volume of patients is much lower than in the system. Mine is higher because of the addiction patients. I have to see them more often. They, they pretty much at first when they start addiction treatment, and I'm talking about opioid dependence primarily, but I do treat addiction and I treat some other, I mean, uh, alcoholism and some other addictions as well. Um, turns out I, I got into the... Uh, low carb space. So I, I actually treat many people who have, I guess you could call it food addiction, but it's really sugar addiction. So um, I got into that space as well, ended up developing an app during the pandemic to help people with um, lifestyle change. Um, so my patient volume is higher than most direct primary care doctors, but generally it's four to five patients a day in person, sometimes less. And then a lot of work is done over the phone by email, texting. We do, tell, we, it's called telemedicine, but it's just, it's very simple. It's really just a phone call. So if somebody wants to do a telemedicine call and they want to do it by video, or if I feel like it's necessary to do it by video, we will, but oftentimes it's just, it's really just a phone call. Um, the monthly fee, uh, my, I'm the cheapest <laughs> direct primary care doctor in the Louisville area, so I've been getting a lot more patients lately. I guess everybody else has increased their prices. I have not. 
costs less than one Starbucks, Vendi coffee, Verdi coffee daily, and less, of course, less than a cell phone. I mean, we all know how much those smartphones cost. Um, the other thing that I'm able to do, which is awesome, is I have built relationships with some of the specialists in town. And so if I have somebody that I think needs to be seen the same day or needs to be seen quickly, I can contact them. Um, I've worked with um, with OBs. Some of my patients, when they get pregnant, they want to do their primary. They want to do their prenatal care with me. They're just more comfortable because they don't have to sit in, in a crowded waiting room for three hours to have their belly measured and listen to a heartbeat. <laughs> so we can do that. I have a a, a portable ultrasound in my in my office, um, and then I just speak with the OB, make them comfortable. If I get uncomfortable at any point, I can send the patient to the OB. Um, and then we also are able to find uh, imaging options, so x-rays, MRIs, CAT scans, much lower priced. I'm sure everybody's familiar with green imaging here. Um, we have some options similar to that in Kentucky and Indiana. Indiana is much better for some reason. I think maybe our certificate of need laws in Kentucky are not very good because it seems like often I'm having to send people to Indiana for these low cost options, but it's, it's not far. Um, it's probably 20 minutes to the nearest town in Indiana. And then there are benefits to the system. It's less complicated. It saves the healthcare system money overall, and it helps to restore our reputation. Like I was saying early, we have a, a crisis of physician reputation right now. Um, restores the doctor-patient relationship, and then less fraud. With, what I'm seeing with, when I say fraud, technically I don't think it's that big of a deal, but it's a big deal to the government. If you're, if you're documenting that you did a complete review of systems, if you're documenting that you that you touched the patient, that you examined the patient, and you actually did not, um, that's, that's fraud, basically. And so um, patients are more aware of this. And, and I'm stunned because I've, I've, I'm familiar with, um, personally familiar with taking my dad to a system doctor who, my dad had pneumonia, and the doctor did not listen to my dad's chest. So I just... You know, that we're seeing more and more of that. I don't know what that is. I don't know where that's coming from, but um, it's, it's very concerning. Oh, this is, this is a, a photo that was going around the internet and people were ranting about. Um, this, is, this is Kentucky. This is Kentucky Medicaid. And um, this is how they incentivized primary care physicians in Kentucky who accepted Medicaid to give um, the COVID vaccine. Um, and there are um, a lot of people who didn't want it and didn't need it, didn't feel like they needed it. And so they're outraged about this. So this is something that many of these people who are upset about it are looking for doctors in our situation where we don't work for a system anymore. So we're not incentivized in this way. We have the time to have a conversation with the patient. We have the time to provide true informed consent before we give them some sort of therapeutic. Um, and that's what they want. And they know what that means now. As a result of the pandemic, they know what informed consent actually looks like. And so they're demanding it. Um, and then you're, you're directly working for your patients. Um, one of the things that I, I say, which sounds kind of harsh is to people, is if your doctor is working for a hospital system or for the government, your doctor is not working for you. And, and I truly believe that. And I've ex I experienced that with my dad, and it was, it was unfortunate. So um, I kept him out of the hospital. Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> Got him some home oxygen. Um, so this is what you probably care about if you're thinking about starting a direct primary care practice. How do you how do you do that? Um, for me, it was it started with a conversation on the phone with a doctor who was already doing it and who had been successful, and that was Dr. Josh Umber. Um, many of you probably know him, and he is, he is fantastic and very available. Um, so. Me, you could call me and we could talk about it. I've, I've helped coach a few doctors um, who are now doing this, who, who have adopted this model. Join um, AAPS, 
Free Market Medical Association, of course. And then there's the U.S. Medical Association, which Lee Gross was involved in starting. So, um, you know, the AMA is not, they're useless. They're, they're part of the corrupt system. They're captured by pharma. Um, the AFP, totally useless in my opinion. I'm still a member, but I'm, I'm probably not going to be for much longer. And then if you're already, if you're already working within the system, the first thing you want to do is recruit your patients to your new practice. So you want to draft a letter to them and then come up with a business plan. For me, we, had a, we, we developed a business plan. I hired someone to do it because I, it, was, it was so over my head. And this is where we come back to maybe it's a good idea for medical students to learn a little bit about business if that's what they want to do. Um, but it, it cost me $3,000. And then um, my husband was very helpful He's a homicide detective, but he was a business major. So anyway, he helped me, and um, we got a small business loan. And then find out about potential moonlighting. You can opt out of Medicare, which you want to do if you want a pure um, bill the patient only direct primary care practice. You, you don't want a hybrid practice where you're still billing Medicare. You want to opt out. And what that means is you agree not to bill Medicare for any services. However, you will... Um, still be able to refer to specialists, and you'll still be able to send for imaging, and whatever, whatever else you want to do will be covered. Um, so, and if you do that, you can still work at urgent care, you can still work at an ER, for example, um, if you're opted out of Medicare. Um, we have so many resources now, the Atlas Curriculum, DPC Alliance is excellent, and I highly recommend joining that organization. Um, and then you can think about some non-traditional services to add income to your practice. So many DPC docs that I know do the aesthetics, they do the Botox and the fillers for, for patients. And that, you know, that helps support the income. Um, you can do the hormone implants. Functional medicine is, is definitely growing in popularity, probably because um, mainstream medicine went completely clownish during the, the pandemic. And then weight loss coach, coaching is another thing. Um, and then when, when you're talking to people, when you're trying to recruit them to, to your practice, when you're talking to employers, people are gonna have doubts. It sounds too good to be true. And just don't ever apologize for leaving a system that is bad. It's corrupt, nobody's getting good care, so don't apologize for it. One of the things that I hear when people are making that change is I don't want to abandon my patients. I have a panel of 3,000, 4,000 patients. There's no way I can bring them all over. I'm going to be abandoning these patients that, that need me. Well, no, the hospital system already abandoned them because they're, making, they're giving you basically five minutes to see a patient that needs a lot more time. Um, and and they, will, they will trickle in and then once the word gets out in your community that this is cost savings and it's better care, people, it, people will get it. They won't see it as an extra cost. They, they will see it for the value that it provides. Here's a collection of memes. <laughs> um, I might have time for a couple questions. Uh, so Steve Crable from Fort Worth, Texas. So um, I was here last year for the first time to hear what a DPC even meant. So now in that intervening time, I've been trying to build a DPC while I'm a full-time pediatric ER doctor. Um, but then running into those hurdles of probably trying to do too much in trying to create it. Uh, I see what you did on that one slide that kind of outlines this, which is very good. So what do you, what do you believe was that thing that clicked that, or those few things inside of that whole slide that was the difference for you? What, what, what was it that got you over the top to say, I'm doing this now? It's kind of embarrassing, but um, I, was, I was at work and I had you know 19 patients on my schedule in the morning and I started to get behind. I had a patient who needed, he, I listened to his chest, go figure, and he was in AFib. And so I, I came out and I told the practice manager, I'm gonna need some help from one of the other providers, one of, the, one of the nurse practitioners to help me because I'm, I'm going to have to do an EKG on this guy and he's complicated. And she looked at me and she said something like, um, you only have blah, blah, blah patients on your schedule, you know? 
and some profanity came out of my mouth. So um, I actually kind of got reprimanded by, reprimanded by my boss, who was an internal medicine doctor. He owned the practice, but it was a patient center medical home. So yeah, I got reprimanded. And um, I just realized, you know what, this is, this is bad for everybody involved. You know, I had two tiny children at home. My husband's in law enforcement. He was never home. It was, it was just bad. So I, I told Chris, I'm not going to do medicine anymore if I can't make this work. And he was totally supportive. So once I made that decision, and then I got baptized that year too. That I think that was helpful. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, that that's excellent. I did I did end up reaching out to some people, some non-traditional brokers um to help me with that as well. And then another thing is get involved in your community with the with like your local chamber of commerce. You can educate people there. It's very helpful. You could or rotary, you know, um just you'll meet people that will offer to do those things for you. Mhm. Mm That's great. Yeah, I know. It's great. Yeah. Yeah, it's, I, I, I'm spoiled now. I can, I don't really, sometimes I forget how bad it was. Like if we have a bad day, a busy day, and we start to feel some stress in the office, I have to remind my medical assistant, because she was my medical assistant in the system as well. So I have to, I have to like bring her back there. <laughs> no, do you remember what we were doing? You know, so thank you for that. That's, that's, it's, we, we definitely need to. Occasionally, and it, it was, and, and it, it was with Medicare patients too, because they felt like, well, don't I need to see a, a doctor who participates in Medicare? And where I'm able to save them, which I think some, some some doctors can't do it if they can't dispense in office, is on the meds. The meds are because of pharmacy benefit managers, because of the corruption, because of the cartel, as Keith calls it. The medicines that. Um, like most Medicare patients, if they're on five medicines, they're going to pay a, over $100 a month for those medicines. If they get them from me, it's, it's 20 So that's already paying for a big chunk of their membership. And so once word got out that that was the case, then, like you said, we, we also have become... Yes, dispense in Kentucky. In most states, you can. Can you do it in Massachusetts, Jeff? Yeah, I figure you couldn't, yeah. Texas is kind of surprising because they, they call themselves a, a free state, but yeah, they, they... Oh, good, yeah, yeah. I know I've been, I'm on some calls and Senator Hall is on some of the calls. And so he knows that that's an issue we need to address. Mm -hmm. No, please. Sorry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And 
And we can do that without being accused of fraud. Whereas when we were in the system and we said, you know what, I'm going to waive your copay, our boss would yell at us, you know, so... Yeah. Yeah. Good. So, what did you do with the patients who just saw them for whatever, saw the care, and said, no, I need to see? Uh, and they said, well, you're going to offer me everything Medicare, and Medicaid options, I think I might need that. What, what can you offer me other than a side of care for my well exam? Because I don't know what you're doing. How are you going to cover me with my Medicare and Medicaid? <laughs> Most of the time they're talking about specialty. So they get confused. They think that because I am DPC and I've opted out that I'm not going to be able to send them to specialists. So I just reassure them that, no, that's not the case. If, if you need a specialist and that, that specialist is still going to bill your Medicare. Medicaid is different in Kentucky. In Indiana, I'm a, I have a Medicaid number in Indiana and I was able to opt out of Medicaid. In Kentucky, they don't allow it. Like, you have to just not have a Medicaid number in Kentucky. That can be problematic. So I have, um, I've created a way, I'm, I've been creative. <laughs> yeah, so my nurse practitioner still has her Medicaid number. So it, on the off chance that we have a Medicaid patient who needs to see a dermatologist, for example, um, and they want, obviously want that bill to go through Medicaid, then we do it through the nurse practitioner. And we're not, we're not, I've cleared it with lawyers and stuff. I'm not not an idiot, but um, I don't personally have a Kentucky Medicaid. Yeah, your, your patients, you know, uh, their quality varies, and at some point, like, it's just like, you know, we're talking a lot about the issue of access to a patient, and we know that in this model, your patients are actually improved quality. Is this what you're looking at quality, is it reflected in the way of care? Uh, or is it just that? Mm -hmm. Access is a big deal to the patients. It's definitely a huge deal. But I think quality matters. I think time matters and relationship matters. So in terms of the quality metrics, I don't think patients care about that. But the healthcare systems care about that. And Lee Gross has some really good data on that, working with he and an employer they, they were able to collect a ton of data showing that direct primary care saves money and then improves those, those quality metrics that the healthcare system people like. But for me, I think the patients really value the time and the relationship the most. They really do. And so I, 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 a lot of people worry about AI taking our jobs. I don't worry as much about that just because I see how people really value that relationship. She was worried about a lump on her neck, right? So her husband was a little bit more concerned about it. There was some family history of thyroid cancer or this and that. So she, you know, she didn't want to be concerned about it, but her husband did. And I went over and examined her in her home. And I said, you know, I, I can see that you're not as concerned about it, but I see your husband is, and it's going to be your, your mind. Let's just get an ultrasound. So went ahead and got the ultrasound. Um, the report, got the report, and then, you know, she's texting me the whole time saying, have you got the report, have you got the report? Of course, she didn't really want to know, but then she did want to know. That's really the underpinning of it. So I said, I'm getting the report, I'll have it, as soon as I send it, I will call you personally, which I did. And then we talked about, it looks like it's benign. She said, I don't understand any of this that's being said in the report. Well, let me walk you through it. And I walked through every bit of it with her. And I spent that time with her. And she said, well, thank you. I, I can understand it better now because there's a bunch of, you know, how, I'm not sure how many physicians here, how, 
many times the radiologist said clinical correlation, you know, could be, maybe, you know, follow up and whatever. And she was saying, so what does that mean? When do I need to follow up? Does it need to be six months? Does it be, need to be a year? Did I have to worry that whole time that I have cancer? And I said, no. When do you want to repeat it? Right? When, well, what do you mean? When do you want to repeat it? This is the relationship between you and me. I have to respond to what you want. How concerned are you for it that you want to, you want to repeat it in three months, six months? Or just when you think it gets worse, a year? I'm okay with any of that. What do you want to do? Silence. Just no one, no doctor's ever talked to me like that before that I, I can be engaged and involved in the decision making. That's what they want. I mean, I have an electronic medical record. So individually, yes. In terms of um, keeping studies or, or metrics for my entire panel, I don't. I don't do that. But I individually, I will sit down and say, "Well, your your A one C went from here to here." I have patients that have gotten off insulin because I've I've been able to change. You know, convince them. And, and tell them how to change their lifestyle so that they don't, so that their type 2 diabetes improves enough that they can stop taking their insulin. So um, it, the, when you have the time, you can do things like that. And so then you're really improving their care. I'm curious, what responsibility do you put on the patient? Because I believe very firmly that it is a relationship. And so there's things that are my responsibility. There's things that are your responsibility as a patient. Mm -hmm. They well, and they always listen, and and most of most of the time they intend to change, and even people who do be, have behavior change with addiction or with food or whatever, they'll be on track for a while, and then they will, they'll crash, and so then they just need they they rely they like the relationship because they know they can come in and not be judged. And they can try to figure out how to get back on track. And I'm, and I'm pretty honest. Like, I'm pretty human with my patients. So I'll tell them, like, personal struggles of my own, you know, with sugar or, you know, th things that I've been through. Um, they, I think they like for their, their doctors to seem, you know, they want to know that we, you know, we're human. We have the same so challenges. Yeah, and they and patients don't really like they don't come after doctors or sue doctors when they when they have a good relationship with them. Like that's been proven in the you know in the literature and studies. So um, we're at a, the, the the system doctors are at a disadvantage in many ways right now. <laughs>